The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented transcribed as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Many doctors agree that worry is often the real cause of what seem to be physical ailments. The cause of much needless worry is money. Some men worry about the future security of their wives and children. Others worry about poverty and dependency in old age. Others wonder how they'll ever give their children a good education. If any or all of these problems bother you, get in touch with a neighbor of yours. He's your local representative of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. In about 13 minutes, I'd like to tell you more about him and the freedom from worry that comes with membership in the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Tonight, the subject of our FBI file, Extortion. Its title, The Seagull Shakedown. The professional criminal, almost without exception, depends on some kind of protection which will, he hopes, keep him out of prison. Sometimes this takes the form of gun and getaway car, or an attempt to establish alibis, or buy witnesses. However, there is one lawbreaker who counts on getting his protection from the very victims of his crime. This is the extortionist. Statistics in the FBI files show that, as in the case you are about to hear, Many of these criminal parasites have been able to operate for years without their activities ever being reported to law enforcement agencies. Once the payoff starts, the hapless victim of the extortionist finds himself an accomplice in a conspiracy against his own pocketbook, his own peace of mind, and perhaps even his life. Tonight's FBI file opens at a fashionable beach club located in a small resort town a few miles from a large west coast city. An attractive young woman lies stretched out on the sand watching a pair of husky twin boys who race the waves toward shore. Look at Mommy, we're sealed! Look at us! Yes, darling, I'm watching. (laughs) Well, 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 in that bathing suit, my dear, you hardly look old enough to be anyone's mother. (laughs) Much less the parent of a pair of seals. Hello, Mr. Worth. No, 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 Mary. Not Mr. Worth. Oh? The boys call me Uncle Albert, you know. <laughs> Uncle Albert, then. Ah, that's better. Uh, won't you sit down? Thank you, my dear. Oh, uh, <sighs> isn't often a man my age gets to spend time with such a pretty girl? No, Uncle Albert. You know, vacation's done you worlds of good, Mary. You look positively radiant. I wish I could stay out this season. Well, why not, hmm? Well, Chris didn't leave us that well provided. Oh, too bad, too bad. You know, it'd be fine for the boys. Are you staying long, Uncle Albert? Indefinitely, I hope. You see, I, uh, I live here now. How wonderful. You're retired then, huh? Ah, one can never retire from life, my dear. Let's just say that I've, uh, I've withdrawn from the, uh, main arena, hmm? Well, all the same, <laughs> I envy you. So quiet here, so peaceful. Ah, but the sea's not peaceful. In these very waves, the tragedy of life goes on. Big fish eat little fish, and are, in turn, eaten. <laughs> I see, I see, dear. Fighting, fighting. You see, my dear, fish to go to Jager. Jager? Yes, that's a remarkably smart variety of seagull. You see, he lets the other girls find the fish. Then he frightens them and uh, steals their catch. That's horrible. <laughs> no, that's natural. Oh, dear, 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 I almost forgot the carnival. Carnival? Mm-hmm. 
One's open down the beach. Now, I thought the boys might join me in a ride on the merry-go-round. Oh, I bet they would. Well, how about it, Chris? Want to go on the merry-go-round? Oh, can we? Can we, Uncle Why, Robert? of course you may. Mommy? <laughs> oh, it's all right. <laughs> oh, boy, hey, what a come along, come along. Your Uncle Albert will oh, show you how to, how to catch the brass ring. What's that? Well, it's a very important thing in life, knowing how to catch the brass ring. Come on, boys. We're off to catch the bass ring, the bass ring, ring, the bass ring. We're off to catch the bass ring. Mary, for the life of me, I just can't even understand it. I understand what's so high. Your twins and my Jean can keep riding that thing. I got it again, Uncle Albert. Oh, boy, Chris. Well, that's the third time he's got the ring. I get seasick just watching him. Oh, Sue. <laughs> well, you, you no need to worry about your offspring, Mrs. Bradley. I don't? You know, it's a, it's a proven fact that the stomach of the immature Homo sapiens is is lined with cast iron. Honest? <laughs> oh, Mr. <laughs> oh, oh, there she goes, straight for the ice cream stand. Excuse me, everybody. Jean, honey, you want to spoil your dinner now? Oh, dear, 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 dear me. The protective instincts of motherhood. Hmm. Uh, uh, it's good to sit down. Uncle Albert, you're wonderful with the children. Well, I can't help it. I, I just naturally love them. Uncle Albert. Uh, yes, my dear? I've got to talk to somebody. Well, if I can help you, I... Well, I, I don't know. Read this. Mmm. Shocking, shocking. Uh-huh. No signature? No. There's been one in the mail every day for a week. Like this? Worse. Well, is it true? Any of it? Of course not. My husband was a fine man. A fine officer. To claim that he took money and sold out his Now, man. now, now. You've nothing to worry about. As long as you can prove he's innocent. Prove? They're all dead. How can I? What shall I do? Well, uh, I'd advise paying off. But it's all a lie. Well, so is much of what you read. Truth isn't important. It's what people believe to be true. And they'll believe the worst about Chris? Inevitably. So, well, I should, I should pay the 5,000 if I were you. 5,000? Well, that would be sufficient, I should think. But the letters don't say how much. Well, I'm sure that 5,000 will do. How can you be? The man who wrote the letters may Mary, want... I wrote them. You wrote them. Yes, like the Jager, I too must let others do my fishing for me. Well, my dear? I don't know what to say. Well, uh, you'll be at the club dance tomorrow night? Yes. My, my joints are a bit creaky for the samba, but I often stand on the pier, you know, and listen to the music and watch the sea. I'll be there. I'm sure of it. Mommy! Mommy! Hey, wait, Chris! Save the white horse for your Uncle Albert! The following morning at the FBI field office in the nearby metropolis, Special Agent Taylor reports to Agent in Charge Robert Woods. Oh, yes, Taylor. Here. Take a look at this photograph. Thank you, sir. Mean anything to you? Well, I'd guess she's somebody's rich aunt. Name's Anna Allen, local society leader, prominent in half a dozen charitable organizations. And? Her body was found at 9 a.m. yesterday. Coroner lists cause of death as coronary thrombosis. Where do we fit in, sir? Her death may or may not have been attributable to a series of threatening letters found in her effects. Mm -hmm. Which classification? Bodily harm or personal scandal? Some of both, according to her lawyer. Uh, she pay off? Mm -hmm. Here's the file, what there is of it. Thanks. Uh, ten years. And in cash. That's right. Regular withdrawals, small bills. Mm -hmm. 
Attorney for the estate is Frank Harriman down in the First National Building. He has the letter, so you might as well start there. All right, I'll get right on it. You know, it's funny, Mr. Woods. Hmm? She'd come to us ten years ago, she could have saved herself a lot of money. Yes, a lot of money and maybe a heart attack. Twenty. Your serve, Mary. Of course, I told it. None of my business, but while we're talking about the dignity of the club, you'd think the board would do something about those bikini bathing suits Betty Booth is always wearing. Oh, wait a That's my game. <sighs> like I was saying to Jeff last week, of course he's a man, he doesn't look at things quite the same, but... Sure, because it's your serve. Sue, hmm? remember that fur cape of mine? The pastel mink? Sure, what about it? You always liked it, didn't you? Honey, I've been green with Emmy for two years. Would you... Uh, would you be interested in buying it? What? You can have it for a thousand. It's worth twice that. Well, I, I don't know, It's Mary. in perfect condition. Yeah, but, but there's... Jeff, he's kind of conservative. About money, anyway. You, you could ask him. Okay. Well, how come you want to sell it? I need the money. Oh? It's for a friend. She... Well, she's... Pretty desperate. Well, how desperate? Five thousand dollars. Wow. I promised to help her. Is she sick or something? No, it's um well, I, I guess you'd call it blackmail. Well, she's gonna pay it? Well, what else can she do? Well, I know what I do. What? I tell my husband all about it. Jeff's always getting me out of trouble. <laughs> like the time I drove the car through Carson's plate glass well, window. Well, this girl it can't do that. Why not? She hasn't got a husband. She, she's a widow. Oh, I see. Turn up anything on the extortion, Taylor? Well, looks like these notes were an outside job, Mr. Woods. They're all typed on the same machine. An Adler, model 37. Foreign. I'm uh, manufactured in Frankfurt. There's not many around this part of the country. Well, we'll send out photographic samples, check the distributor. And all you got? Well, I think the writer was a man, close friend of the deceased. He had a lot of friends. Yeah, I know. Three address books full. Well, get on it. Maybe you can narrow them down. All right, sir. Good evening, Mary. <laughs> I expected you sooner. I couldn't get away. My, 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 what a lovely gown. <laughs> you, you shouldn't have come without a wrap, though. The sea air is chill. Thanks. Oh, but I, I am concerned about your health. It's very important to me, my dear. I know. Mary, I'm afraid that you don't understand. I, I bear you no malice, my child. As a matter of fact, it's quite, quite the contrary. It's because I'm so very fond of the boys and of you that I, I selected you to be my, uh, uh, well, my, my family. Your family? Yes. See, I'm not young anymore, and uh, I have a certain standard to maintain. Since I haven't any children or grandchildren to support me in my old age, I, I've had to adopt them. Oh. I'd hoped it wouldn't be necessary to call on you. I had an old friend who kept me in, uh, shall we say, uh, <laughs> fish and chips. But uh, she had a bad heart, and, well, I've only a few more years at best. You want them to be happy years, don't you, Mary? Oh. Now, Mary, wait. Wait, wait. You haven't given your old Uncle Albert his fish. Let go of me. Mary. Keep away from me. Be careful. That raining. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. Oh, dear. We will return in just a moment to tonight's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. One way to get the most out of life is to have a good, solid education. Now, you want that kind of education for your child, but you may not be sure that you're making enough money to see the child through. 
That was the problem that had Mr. William Warden bothered until he became a member of the Equitable Society. How about that, Mr. Warden? That's true, Mr. Keating. I have three children, two girls and a boy, and I wanted them to have a good education. What had me sitting up nights was this. How in the world could I do it on the kind of money I make or if something happened to me? And how did you solve your problem, Mr. Warden? My local equitable representative solved it for me. You see, I heard you describe an educational plan on this program that seemed to fit my pocketbook. That's our equitable education fund. That is correct. Then my equitable man showed me how I could spread the costs for my children's education over 15 years while they were growing up and without putting a crimp in our budget. And it was mighty reassuring to know, too, that if something happened to me, the entire fund became established with no more premiums to pay. Lucky day for me and my children when I called my equitable man. He's a real credit to Equitable, and he's a good man to do business with. If there are any other fathers listening in who want to give their children a real break, it's easy. Call up your local Equitable representative. Yes, you'll find your local Equitable representative a helpful neighbor and a good man to do business with. He knows life insurance. So no matter what your life insurance problem, security for your wife and youngsters, an independent old age, ownership of your home free and clear... Talk it over with your friendly and helpful Equitable representative. Simply consult your local telephone directory for the name of your local representative of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Seagull Shakedown. Figures in the possession of your FBI clearly show crime to be America's poorest paid occupation. Added to this factor are hazards, imprisonment, nervous strain, bodily injury, degenerative illness. Yet, as in tonight's case, the FBI files frequently reveal a professional criminal of apparent superior intellect and education. This so-called smart crook thinks the world owes him a living, that he's too smart to work for it, too smart for the law. He has to find out the hard way the futility of playing a lone hand against the intelligent, scientific, thorough army of law enforcement agents. By then, it's too late. A mind that might have served mankind has been used only for its own destruction. Tonight's FBI file continues at headquarters where Special Agent in Charge Woods receives a phone call. Woods speaking. Hello, Mr. Woods. This is Rich Franklin, County Sheriff's Office. Yes, Rich. What can we do for you? Need a little help. Glad to do what we can. Anything in our jurisdiction? Yes. What's the case? Down at the Shorebird Club. Girl drowned last night. Found her body under the club pier. Foul play? I'm not sure yet. Well, where do we fit in? I picked up her purse floating in the surf. Had a couple of threatening letters mailed to her. Hmm. Threatening bodily harm? Yes. I'll get an agent on it. Where will you be? At the club. 12,000 Coast Highway. Well, then you think Mary Cornell's so-called friend was really Mary herself. Well, I'm just positive of it, Mr. Taylor. Uh-huh. In the first place, that stuff about her having no husband and being a widow, and just ain't no woman in her right mind try to sell her only mean coat just to help out a friend. Mrs. Bradley, you're sure Mary didn't drop any hint about who might be trying to extort money from her? No, not a whisper. But I know who it was. You do? The man who killed her, that's who. Well, that's right, isn't it? That's why she was... she was murdered. Well, we don't know that she was murdered, Mrs. Bradley. That's one of the things we're trying to find out. He killed her, all right. One way or another, he killed her. Those poor kids of hers. Yes, I know. If I ever lay my hands on him, I'll... Well, suppose I'll... you leave that to the law, Mrs. Bradley. That's our job. <laughs> Hold it, Rich, will you? You found something? Yeah, I think so. There's some blood on its piling. Coroner's report showed skull fracture as cause of death, didn't it? Well, that's right. Rich, you got a pocket knife? Oh, yeah. Here, Jim, catch. Thanks. Get a lab report on this blood smear and see if it types out like the dead woman's. You figure she fell through that railing and hit her head on the way down? 
Yeah, it sure looks that way. Which could rule out murder. Yeah. Yeah, it might. You want to check anything more out here? No. Let's shove off. I want to get this specimen in the laboratory for examination right away. Here's the lab report on the Cornell extortion notes, Mr. Woods. Show anything? Uh, done on ordinary typing paper, 25% rag content bond, common brand. Mm-hmm. What about the machine? Old office model Remington, elite type, capital A off center. And? And that's it so far. Oh, I spotted an old Remington in the lobby at the Shorebird Club. Rich Franklin's picking up a specimen for us now. Well, this one sounds full time. You want to shift someone else onto the Allen case? No, no, sir, I, I don't. You think there's a tie? Could be. Mrs. Allen belonged to Shorebird, along with a dozen other clubs. Hmm. Notes reveal the same method of operation? No, I'm afraid not. The women know each other? Well, not well, anyway. Mary Cornell wasn't on my list. There's no Allen in the drowned woman's address book. Different typewriter, different M.O. Well, I know there's nothing tangible, sir. It's Well, it's just that there's something about those notes. They're, they're smooth and literate, almost too literate. Hmm. How do you account for the switch typewriters? Uh, maybe he was short of money, pawned or sold his own. Then used the club machine to go after his next victim? Sounds worth a try. I'll put Phillips on the pawn shops. You correlate the two sets of address books and run down the duplications. Right. While agent John Phillips checked local pawn shops and secondhand stores for a recently disposed of Adler, model 37... Agent Jim Taylor made a tedious comparison of address books. Twenty names were duplicated, starting with Anderson Marie and ending with Worth Albert, each a potential suspect, each to be investigated, checked, and, if innocent, cleared. Meanwhile, on the pier at the Shorebird Club, Albert Worth went fishing. Hello there, Mr. Worth. Catching anything? Well, it seems, Mrs. Bradley, that the fish have already had their lunch. Right over here. That's where they say the accident happened, right here. Oh, it was an accident then. Well, I guess so. That's what the police say. Oh, a tragedy, a real tragedy. I I wish there was something more I could do. Why, you were just wonderful to the boys taking care of them till Ann came from Cincinnati. Poor lost twins. Just like Romulus and Remus alone in the wilderness. Huh? Oh, yeah. I wonder why she was on the pier that time of night. Well, the way the FBI figures it... FBI? I thought you said it was an accident. Oh, sure, but... Well, I guess it's all right to tell you, you and her being so friendly and all. It looks like Mary came out here to meet a man. Oh? An extortionist. Really? You mean someone was trying to blackmail her? Uh Uh-huh. Well, that's why the FBI's on the case. Well, how do you know? Well, Mary told me all about it that afternoon before. All? Well, not exactly everything... Well, I don't figure the FBI would like me to be talking about it. Dear, 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 poor Mary. Who was this man? Is someone out of her past? Well, I don't rightly know. She didn't say. Oh, how unfortunate. Well, I figure the FBI will find out pretty quick, though. They most always do, I guess. Do they? Mm-hmm. Oh, I guess your luck's improving. You got a bite. Yeah, yeah so I have. Oh, oh, he got off the hook. <laughs> I'm afraid so. Well, you don't seem very concerned. Well, when you've lived as long as I have, my dear, you'll learn that there are always other fish in the ocean. All right, Mrs. Nevins. Yes, thank you very much for your help. We appreciate it. Twelve down, eight to go. Mm -hmm. Who's next? Ah, uh, next one's Mervyn Richards, dealer in antiques, married, three kids. Lives over in the... Uh, I'll get it. Okay. Wood speaking. What? Oh, fine, Phillips. Good. Yes. Okay, shoot. Jack's type right to 218 West 3rd Avenue. Stick around. Someone will be right down. Is that our Adler? Sounds like it. The salesman remembers taking one as a trade-in on a Corona portable. Seller was a fellow named Goldsmith. Goldsmith. Emil Goldsmith. Emil Goldsmith. Not on the list. Oh, did uh, Phillips check the machine's identity? Store job to, to an eastern wholesaler. Okay, here I go. Oh, 
Mr. Worth, are you oh. moving out? Oh, no, 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 my dear. These bags are just for a little trip. I, I have to go away for a few days. Golly, kind of sudden, wasn't it? Yes, yes, it was. Business? Well, not exactly. To tell you the truth, it it concerns Mary. Oh, really? Yes, I, I think I know who was... You know, uh, shaking her down, so to speak. Well, gee, Mr. Worth, that's wonderful. Who is he? Well, I prefer not to say, my dear. I'd rather that the, the FBI checked into it first. Well, I see what you mean. Oh, that's my cab, I think. Uh, Taylor, that's his name. Who? The FBI agent who was here, Mr. Taylor. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I, well, I, I remember to ask for him. Uh, cabby, I, I want to go to the air. Well, Mr. Taylor, I was just mentioning you. Mr. Worth here was just going downtown to see you. Mr. Worth, this here is the FBI man I was telling you about. Uh, how do you do? Hello, Worth. It's quite a coincidence. I came all the way down here to see you. Why don't we ride back to town together? Maybe we can have a nice long talk. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Well, I don't suppose I have much choice in the matter. No, Worth. No choice at all. <laughs> Albert Worth was found guilty of violating the Federal Extortion Act and was sentenced to five years in a federal penitentiary. Detainers were filed against Worth by state authorities in connection with the deaths of the two victims. The typewriter shop provided Agent Taylor with the address of the man who had traded in the Adler. Interviewed at FBI field headquarters, he revealed that he had bought it from a friend, Albert Worth. FBI lab reports on the Adler typewriter clearly showed this to be the machine used in writing the extortion notes received by Mrs. Anna Allen. The case of Albert Worth demonstrates the way law enforcement agencies operate against extortionists and blackmailers. If you or any of your friends or family receive extortion threats of any kind, immediately notify your local police department or the nearest office of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Don't pay off. Without his victims to shield him, The extortionist will soon be extinct. No matter what your income may be, the chances are you think you'd be happier if you made more money. Actually, your future security depends on how you handle the money you do make. If your problem is how to take care of your money then make a date with a neighbor of yours. He's your local Equitable Society representative. If you have an average income, he can show you how to protect your family, provide for your children's education, own your own home. Why not talk it over with him? Consult your telephone directory for the name of your local representative of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Its subject, Internal Security. Its title, His Brother's Keeper. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of places or persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Robert Yale Libet. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Richard Beals, Georgia Ellis, Betty Lou Gerson, Lou Merrill, Vernon Rich, and Victor Rodman. This Is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling transcribed story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. His brother's keeper on This Is Your FBI. This program came to you from Hollywood.